Okay, let's take a look at a race condition in the loading of cellular firmware on Qualcomm systems on a chip. These Qualcomm systems are popular on smartphones and often they serve as the primary application processor. That's what you normally think of as the CPU where your Linux runs on your Android system. But they can also, because they are systems on a chip, they can also integrate peripheral processors that have wireless capabilities such as cellular, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth. So on this, you can see that the modem and the Wi-Fi are shown in their marketing image as being part of a same subcomponent. Also, FYI, wireless capabilities are often called the baseband. So the important thing to know here is that the code for this, the firmware for the modem or the Wi-Fi, gets loaded by this, which is the main application processor, or AP. So in the research, they basically showed this sort of diagram where they said they were focusing on this baseband subsystem, which handles the modem and firmware. And then you have components in the Linux kernel that handles loading of the firmware. And then there's the stuff you would normally think about as Android and Wi-Fi daemons and stuff like that running on the AP. So the particular vulnerability has to do with the loading of the modem or cellular baseband firmware. So there's a component called MBA, Modem Boot Authenticator. And when he looked at all of the files, he can see all of these. So you've got MBA files, you've got modem files, and you've got some other miscellaneous. So the MBA files and the MBA.MBN are the things that are verified actually by the ROM on the peripheral processor that runs this code. Then there's some metadata, modem.mdt. It's just metadata used by Linux. Then the primary firmware is the files named like modem.b00, etc. So they provided this nice sequence diagram to help us understand how this firmware loading works. And I've provided you some breakdown of the acronyms. PIL is Peripheral Image Loader. It's a component of the Linux kernel running on the AP that is responsible for loading up the MBA, Modem Boot Authenticator. So it's going to load the MBA and modem images into RAM. Then it's going to set some modem registers, such as the start address where you can find that MBA that it just stuck in the RAM. It's going to set some registers on the peripheral processor. It's called the primary bootloader or just the ROM. It's running off in its own separate CPU that is not equal to the application CPU. So it sets some registers and then it resets the modem CPU to say, all right, go ahead and get started. Those registers will still be set. So then the PBL, primary bootloader, will get started and figure out based on those registers where to find that code that was written into RAM. It will read and authenticate the modem boot authenticator, and then it will jump into the modem boot authenticator. And the modem boot authenticator will then read and authenticate subsequent modem images, which were also loaded into RAM at this first stage by the peripheral image loader. So the peripheral image loader, this is just sort of a sequence of what all happens. It's not that interesting to us, but it's just to say that ultimately the Linux kernel is responsible for setting up all of this RAM, initializing it, and poking the other modem CPU in order to wake it up and tell it to go authenticate and load those images. The only reason I showed this is just to mention that there is some uh, references in this diagram to things like modem physical addresses and regions having to do with trust zone. Uh, that's going to matter later on. Trust zone is a mechanism for uh, making ARM-based systems more trustworthy. But I'm going to come back to this point at the very end, just to say there is some trust zone in play here, but I'm not sure it's actually doing what's necessary in order to make the system trustworthy for a particular attack that we'll talk about at the end. Okay, so showing it in my sort of sequence diagram here instead of the one that the researcher provided, you can imagine that the Linux kernel is running on the application processor and it is writing in these images such as the MBA, the modem boot authenticator, and then it's also writing in the modem firmware. After it's written all of those files into just RAM, which is a shared resource shared between the AP and the modem CPU, then it will disable its own access to shared RAM so that it's not gonna fiddle with that anymore, and then it will send a reset signal over to the modem CPU telling it, hey, restart and go ahead and get started authenticating the MBA and loading the MBA. Upon receiving this signal, the ROM or the PBL or the modem CPU 
is going to go ahead and get started reading that MBA and ultimately verifying it. It wants to do a digital signature check and authentication on that. And it says, if the signature check verifies, then it's great, it's good. Go ahead and jump right in and start executing this code. So again, this code that's running right now is ROM code that's literally baked into the silicon. And it's trying to read and verify this firmware before jumping to that and that firmware will then verify the subsequent components. Okay, so now let's assume that the MBA is executing and it is going to be responsible for reading and verifying all of these chunks of modem firmware and making sure that it's authenticated and if and only if it fully authenticates, then it will execute it in place. Again, just sort of swapping out its code and now starting to run this code. So they showed that the core vulnerability, the core talk to vulnerability here, is that the MBA may have already verified this modem B05, but then the Linux kernel can come along and modify it. And it verified modem B6, and then the Linux kernel comes along and modifies it. And so there's this race condition that like, while this MBA CPU is going down the line verifying things, executing in parallel is the Linux kernel on the application processor, and it can go ahead and just scribble over these things. Because if we go back to this diagram and we assume that the Linux kernel has been compromised, then, well, what if it just didn't disable its own access to shared RAM? What if it just left that capability for itself? It certainly can if it's already compromised. So the net result, if it's already compromised, is that while the MBA is running, it can be reading, but then the attacker on the kernel can be overwriting the modem contents after they've been read. So the first read will fetch clean data and that clean data will go into the authentication. So it's gonna be checking, was that clean? And yes, it'll say that it's clean. But then it's the fact that after the fact, it goes into execute in place. It says, I'm gonna just go ahead and jump into this code now. Well, that's sort of the second fetch, but that second fetch occurred after the attacker had overwritten it with malicious values, thanks to the race condition. So fundamentally, we've got a time of check time of use time of check everything was clean it was overwritten after the time of check and before the time of use at which point it's executed in place so what does the eye of hal tell us this is it tells us it's a time of check time of use vulnerability and specifically caused by a double fetch in the sense that the first fetch is a literal read in order to do digital signature verification and all of those subsequent fetches are reads by the CPU to execute code. So what does an attacker actually do with this though? We've already said that the attacker has full arbitrary code execution in the Linux kernel on the AP, so it's not exactly giving them privilege escalation. Well, what an attacker could do with this and what the researcher did is they can use this capability on their own phone to inject a debugger into the Wi-Fi firmware, which subsequently gets loaded after the modem firmware, and that will aid them in reverse engineering the code. Then they can go off and use that reverse engineering to find an over-the-air Wi-Fi exploit. So that's a big problem, right? So, okay, the researcher on their own phone can have Linux kernel access, but maybe they're not gonna have Linux kernel access. Well, certainly they're not gonna have Linux kernel access by default on your phone. But if they can find a Wi-Fi bug so that if you're physically in Wi-Fi proximity, they can just send magic packets and break into the Wi-Fi firmware. Well, from there, it just becomes a different game of breaking out of the Wi-Fi firmware and into the Linux kernel and taking over all the rest of your phone. And that's exactly the sort of vulnerability that these researchers covered. So that gets to a second and very important point in the context of firmware. The fact that this architecture was designed to still fully and separately integrity verify the modem and Wi-Fi firmware running on a separate processor even assuming that the Linux kernel was compromised, that's a good sort of defense in depth mechanism because basically, you know, you could imagine that, well, if there's no privilege escalation to go, the attacker is not going to want to do anything. But sometimes security mechanisms are not just about specifically taking over the phone at one privilege level. They're maybe about defending against an attacker doing the research necessary to take it over from a different perspective. In this case, taking it over via the Wi-Fi instead of, you know, taking it over via a browser-esque exploit followed by a kernel exploit and that kind of thing. 
So defenses like this to integrity verify the firmware to stop someone from writing a debugger into it and then subsequently reverse engineering all of it, they are defenses against analysis and they shouldn't be the top order priority, like you should spend your prioritization time on ways to stop exploits in the first place, but usually once you get to a relatively hardened architecture, uh, it becomes possible and worth your time to put a little bit of time into uh, disabling trivial analysis by would-be attackers. Okay, well, what was the fix for this? There was no fix as far as I can tell. There doesn't seem to be any Qualcomm CVE pertaining to it or referring to it. I asked one of the researchers about whether Qualcomm fixed this vulnerability or not, and they didn't say anything. Other problems in their research papers describe CVEs, so there were CVEs issued for other problems by Qualcomm, but not this apparently. So that's a little suspicious. And uh, my theory about why there's no CVE here is that it feels to me like the exact same vulnerability would work against the MBA, right? This sort of race condition with the uh, Linux kernel just overwriting contents in RAM that is subsequently used by the modem CPU. Now I could be off base here because I did show you that Linux pill thing having to do with trust zone and stuff like that. But again, remember all of that Linux trust zone setup was happening on the AP side and the AP can just choose not to do that. So anyways, there may be something about the ROM that requires trust zone or something like that. And so Maybe trust zone is in effect in the ROM phase, but not the MBA phase, and that stops the MBA from being compromised, but I don't know. Anyways, if I am not off base here, and if trust zone does not stop an attack against the MBA, then that would actually mean what they've got on their hands is an unfixable ROM bug in the PBL, the primary bootloader in the ROM. And so if I am correct here and it is an unfixable ROM bug, then Qualcomm may have just said, well, there's no point fixing the MBA talk to because there's a ROM talk to which can give the attacker code execution even earlier. So let's not even bother. And that is actually the right move in this situation. If it's a ROM bug, there's literally zero point to putting engineering time towards fixing something else further down the stack that can ultimately be uh, undercut by something earlier in the stack. So anyways, that's just my theory. I don't know if that's true or not. Hopefully, maybe the researchers will reply to me at some point and tell me whether or not I'm off base, but that was this vulnerability.